The next example we're going to look at involves a rational function. Uh, again, if we kind of keep in mind that ultimately our goal here right, is to understand how the, the derivative, first and second derivatives of a function shape the graph, well, we can start thinking about what's going on with a function like this, right? So we know that we can factor the denominator. And so if we were going to plot this function as a first step, we would know that there are vertical asymptotes at 1 and at minus 1. And we know that the origin is an intercept. Um, and what else could we figure out from just looking at the function? Well, we can, we can consider limits involving infinity. We know how to deal with those. We know that as x goes to infinity, because the degree of the denominator is larger, we know that the limit as x goes to infinity will be 0. So we know that the x-axis is going to be a horizontal asymptote. We've got our vertical asymptotes. Um, we could also consider the sine of, of f, right? So we have these three points. We have we have two asymptotes and we have zero. And again, we could work out that our function is going to be positive if x is bigger than 1. All three factors are positive. Uh, between 0 and 1, one of the three factors is negative, so we have a minus sign. Between minus 1 and 0, two of the three factors are negative, so we get an overall positive. And for x less than minus 1, all three factors are negative, so we have a minus sign. Um, now that's useful because that's already, and notice I haven't even taken a derivative yet. Um, and yes, I know really we're just asking about concavity here, but we're working towards curve sketching, so let's fill in some details. Right? Um, what these signs tell me on either side of the asymptote is they tell me that my graph is going down there. It's going up there, right? It's going down here. It's going up here, right? So we already have a bit of the graph filled out. Now we move on. Let's calculate, let's actually proceed to our solution, okay? So, before we can get to the second derivative, we need the first derivative. That's going to require quotient rule, right? The derivative of the top is 1 times the bottom, okay? Minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. And we divide by the bottom squared, okay? We can clean this up a little bit, right? This is x squared minus 1 minus 2x squared. We have minus x squared minus 1 over x squared minus 1, all squared. And we leave it at that. Now, um, if you were going to analyze the first derivative, which we're not, you might notice that the denominator can never be negative. Okay, it can be 0 at plus or minus 1, but it can never be negative. The numerator can never be positive because both of these terms are negative and we have x squared, right? This is always less than or equal to 0. That's minus 1. So this whole thing is always less than or equal to minus 1. Um, so that means that our function is actually decreasing everywhere except at the asymptotes. And that kind of already tells you what has to be happening, right? We know that we have to have a horizontal asymptote here here. We know there are no further intercepts, right? This is the only intercept, so you kind of already know that you must be looking at something something like this, right? Um, the only thing that we don't know is in the middle, we know it's going to come down, right? And at some point, and we kind of already know that the concavity, right? There, there are a lot of sort of sanity checks that you can do along the way, right? Um, your graph has to be concave down here, even though we haven't, even though we haven't done derivative yet. Yeah? Um, we know the graph has to be concave down as we approach this vertical asymptote, as we approach from the left, because if it was concave up, it's going to collide with the asymptote. We know that doesn't happen. We know it's got to go this way, right? It has to be concave down. It has to be concave up here. 
concave down, concave up, right? Um, we kind of know that's going to happen. The only thing we don't know is somewhere between here and there, there's got to be a point of inflection, switching from concave down to concave up. You might already be able to guess because you do have some symmetry here, right? This is it's an odd function, right? Um, the graph for x less than 0 is the reflection across the origin of the graph when x is bigger than 0. Um, symmetry tells you that that inflection point is probably going to happen at the origin. Um, and so we can kind of guess that our graph should look something like that, OK? So we more or less already have the graph. We haven't even done the second derivative. Why bother? Well, because the graph asks us to find the intervals. Let's make sure that we got this right, yeah? I kind of guessed here. If we, want to, if we want to be sure, we should actually compute this derivative and do the work. Um, another reason to proceed with the derivative here is it's good to see a few examples of computing second derivatives when there are rational functions involved because um, there's a certain amount of care that you need to take here if you want to sort of keep this problem reasonable, if you don't want to make your life too miserable. Um, of course, you're going to have to do quotient rule again, right? So derivative of the top is minus 2x times the bottom. And I'm going to leave that bottom in this form, okay? This sort of factored form. I'm not going to expand it out, okay? Minus the top. I guess we can cancel some minus signs, times the derivative of the bottom. And for the derivative of the bottom, I want to use the chain rule, right? 2 comes down in front, x squared minus 1, times the derivative of the inside, times 2x, okay? And then we square the denominator. So we're squaring a square, so we're going to get the fourth power on the bottom. Okay. Now, there's a good reason to do the derivative the way I did, which is that you'll notice that both terms in the numerator have this x squared minus 1 in them, right? If you multiply everything out at this stage, you're going to be in for a whole lot of work and a whole lot of trouble, and you're not going to be very happy. What you really want to do is simplify at this stage. You want to factor out, bring out that common factor, right? Um, and, you know, let's be just a little bit late. We know we can bring that common factor out. So there's one of them here. It's going to cancel completely. There's two of them here. Now, I can only bring out one, right, because there's only one over here. So I can get rid of one of these two, and those are both going to cancel with one of the four on the bottom. And we're left with three on the bottom, okay? Now we simplify. Now we have minus 2x times x squared minus 1. Push that minus sign through, x squared plus 1 times 4x over x squared minus 1 cubed. There's a 2x that's common. Let's factor it out. 2x times Bring that minus sign through. Minus x squared minus minus 1 is plus 1. Okay. And there's a 2 left over here, right? 4x is 2 times 2x. So 2 times x squared. And then 2 times 1. Okay. All right. So we still have to clean this, uh, this up the top. What do we have? 2x. 2x squared minus x squared. x squared plus 3. Okay? Now, this is a sum of squares. Always positive. So we do indeed have only one 0, right? It's equal to 0 when x is 0. So if we were going to draw a sine diagram, it's going to look like this. Okay? 
we mark off zero, right? So the second derivative is equal to zero when x equals zero. But we don't forget about our asymptotes, right? Put them in. Because even though the second derivative is not defined at the asymptotes, right, the function is not defined at the asymptotes, it could still change sign at the asymptotes, right? And indeed, if we, if we kind of factor at the bottom, right, we've got something like that. Now, if x is bigger than 1, Everything here is positive, right? So the whole thing is positive here. If x is between 0 and 1, x minus 1 becomes negative. If you cube a negative, it stays negative, okay? So this changes sign, but the rest stays positive. So overall, negative, okay? Between minus 1 and 0, well, this is still negative. This is still positive. This is always positive. This becomes negative. Those two negatives cancel give you a positive. Finally, if x is less than minus 1, x plus 1 becomes negative. It's an odd power, so it stays negative. Now I have 1, 2, 3, right? Odd number of minus signs, so I get a sign diagram that looks like this. And that means that f is going to be an... By the way, we're often lazy and we'll say the function is concave up. Really, we should say the graph is concave up. Um, but we'll just say f is concave up on minus 1, 0 and 1 to infinity and it's concave down on minus infinity to minus 1 and 0 to 1. And indeed that fits with what we've guessed as our graph, right? So our graph here that we have is, is fairly accurate.